The power plays over two great rivers in the Middle East have been heating up in a three-pronged struggle between Turkey, Syria and Iraq. Turkey is harnessing the Tigris and Euphrates rivers with a series of dams in a grandiose irrigation and hydroelectric plan. The plan, known as the Great Anatolia Project, or GAP, has clear benefits for Turkey. The GAP project will irrigate 1,700,000 hectares of land. This is for Turkey a very important project for the economy of Turkey, for the future, for industry, and for education and culture. For a country whose population is expected to rise to 25 million by 2010, Turkey's long-term plan for controlling the flow of the Euphrates is highly desirable. Something beautiful is happening. There is a new life for me. For my generation, they hadn't done anything in this area. The younger people emigrated to find jobs. But through this dam, we get new houses, new gardens that will be built for us. A lot of jobs will be created. I have confidence. The young have confidence. But Turkey's GAP project is the cause of deep concern to its downstream neighbors, Syria and Iraq. Like Turkey, Syria is also a rapidly developing nation, whose plans for economic growth include using Euphrates river water for irrigation of its northern territories. To provide for this growth, Syria's Takba Dam and other Syrian dams on the Euphrates were designed with the potential to irrigate 640,000 hectares of land. But Syria contends that Turkey's GAP project has inhibited this potential by reducing the water flow downstream and steadily undercutting the power of the Takba Dam. The Syrian government estimates that once Turkey's GAP project is completed, the flow of Euphrates water to Syria will be reduced by a drastic 40 percent. Meanwhile, Iraq contends that the GAP project will reduce its water flow by a still more damaging 90 percent. With Turkey's control of water at the heart of this conflict, the Anatolia Dam has become a potential terrorist target that must be heavily guarded. In the growing conflict over water rights, Syria is supplying both arms and operational land bases to the PKK, Turkey's Kurdish separatists. And in an unprecedented alliance, Syria has sided with her traditional rival Iraq to both condemn and undermine Turkish water dominance. Saber-rattling between these three countries over water rights may seem to be inevitable. Yet the threat of war along the Euphrates River is not caused by a critical shortage of water. The water is there and potentially available to all. So in an attempt to diffuse growing tensions, Turkey has undertaken yet another plan known as the Peace Pipeline. This plan would divert water from Turkey's Senhan and Sehan rivers and is projected to deliver an annual 2,200 million cubic meters of water to Turkey's southern neighbors. As the need for more food and greater economic development heightens along the Euphrates, tensions mount and the danger of a war over water threatens if measures are not taken. For the past half century, the Jordan River has been a key to the growth of the modern nation of Israel. But it has also become the source of life and hope for all people in this region.
Ending its journey in the Dead Sea, the Jordan River begins some 350 kilometers to the north in a mountainous region on the borders of three nations. Ten kilometers below the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River is joined by waters from the Yarmouk River. The Yarmouk, whose major sources are in Syria, forms the border between that country and the nation of Jordan. Modern-day conflicts over both Yarmouk and Jordan River waters began in the 1950s, when the State of Israel began to take shape. To make the desert bloom, Israel needed water from both the Jordan and Yarmouk. From 1953 to 1964, Israel built the National Water Carrier, a complex of canals, pipelines and tunnels designed to transport water from the Sea of Galilee region to the coastal plain of Israel and the Negev Desert. But other nations needed that water too. Many Arabs feared that Israel's national water carrier would divert far too much Jordan River water south of the Sea of Galilee. This would pose a threat to downstream neighbors, Jordan and Syria. In 1964, the first Arab summit proposed to stifle Israeli plans. The following year, Syria began construction of the Headwaters Diversion Plan, whose goal was to prevent Jordan River water from reaching Israel. In the summer of 1965, the Israeli military responded with an open attack on the plan's construction sites. We knocked out the Syrian earth moving equipment and other kind of equipment by tank gun fire. Then we attacked with the Air Force and also the aeroplanes destroyed their earth moving equipment. Uh, then they had to give up and their project of diversion the sources of the Jordan River and deprive Israel of its water was terminated. Two years later, Israeli forces conquered parts of Egypt, Syria and Jordan during the Six-Day War, a war with water as a central issue. By gaining control of Syria's Golan Heights, the Israelis held two of the three headwaters of the Jordan River. They also seized the west bank of the Jordan, the Gaza Strip and the Yakon Taninim Aquifer, which currently supplies one-third of Israelis' fresh water. As a consequence, the imbalance between the nations are dramatic, with Israel having eight times the water resources of the two and a quarter million Palestinians living in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. For myself and my family of three persons, I build a house at a reservoir for water with a capacity of 50 cubic meters. But the occupying authorities demolished my house and the water reservoir. You have to understand that I don't have another source of water. In the village, there are no water infrastructures, no sewage facilities or anything else. Also, there are no springs. The Israeli occupiers are surely taking the water and delivering it to the settlements of Israeli immigrants. I have to tell you that our basic source of water is the sky, and we don't have another source. What we buy, we buy only from the occupiers, and we have to pay a lot for it. While droughts drag on summer after summer, Palestinian villages have water only one or two days a week. Often, villagers must buy their water from private vendors at high prices. 